Hi, my name is Lisa Harrington. I just want to welcome you to Blue Oaks. If this is your first time joining us, we're so glad that you're here. At Blue Oaks, our mission is to lead everyone into Christ-centered living and, and help you as you, you take your next steps with Jesus. Uh, to keep up to date and find out uh, what we're doing around here, you can click the latest news button on the website. Uh, community and building community is really important to us, and what better way to do that than a concert in the park? So we want you to mark your calendars for July 8th, and we're gonna be out at the Pleasanton Concert in the Park for the big band jazz, the Cool Tones, uh, on Friday, July 8th, and the concert's from 7 to 8.30, so come on out and get your seat, and let's have some fellowship and fun. So today we're gonna continue our teaching and Sermon on the Mount, but before we do that, we're gonna have some worship with Michaela and her team. There is a sound I love to hear It's the sound of the Savior's robes As He walks into the room Where people pray Where we hear praise as He hears faith There is a sound I love to hear It's the sound of the Savior's robes As He walks into the room Where people pray Where we hear worship He hears faith aloud sing his praise aloud oh, oh wake my soul and sing sing his praise aloud sing his praise aloud
Last week we looked at how Jesus said, do not judge. Uh, this week we'll go even deeper into how relationships can get off track. Uh, this is what Jesus said. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. All right, we're talking today about the speck and the plank. And Jesus' teaching here is not subtle. He's talking about two categories of problems. Uh, everyone else's problems and my problems. Uh, there are other people's faults and there are my faults. Now, you would think I would be much more aware of my faults than other people's faults. You think I would notice my problem first because, you know, it's my problem. But often I don't notice my problems at all. Plank? You know, what plank? What are you talking about? But I have great clarity on your problem. You know, I fail to take responsibility for my life, but I'm great at blaming other people. I read a bumper sticker recently that said, I didn't say you were wrong. I said I was going to blame you. <laughs> Do you know what my problem is? Uh, my problem is my mother. My problem is my spouse. Uh, my problem is I don't have a spouse. My problem is uh, the place where I work. My problem is I don't have a place to work. My problem is you. I can see your tiny little problem, but I can't see my great big problem. You see, this is the plank. I can't see my problem is me. I can't see my habit of blaming others, of judging others, of avoiding responsibility. People go through their whole life and they never even identify, let alone take responsibility for their real problem, which is them. This is so common that you're probably thinking right now about someone you wish were listening to this message because they really need to hear this teaching. The good news is they are. The bad news is they are you. Now, we learn to evade responsibility and assign blame when we're tiny little sinners. Uh, a woman and her husband tried to teach their little son about how uh, good God is by asking him questions like, who made the sun? God did. Uh, who made the tree? God did. Who made the dinosaurs? God did. One morning she walked into his room and it was a total mess. There were toys everywhere, uh, dirty clothes on the floor, cereal on the floor. And she asked the classic parental question, who made this mess? He said, God did. Where did my children learn how to blame at such an early age? Not for me, that's for sure. Someone I know went to traffic school where everyone had to tell what violation brought them there. Uh, amazingly enough, not one of them was really responsible for breaking the law. Uh, they had all, all kinds of justifications for you know, why they were speeding or for that illegal U-turn. And when it got to him, this guy said, you know what, I didn't stop at the stop sign. Uh, that's why I'm here. I was entirely wrong and I got caught. And there was a moment of silence and then everyone in the room actually cheered for the one honest man in traffic school. Now see, the idea is that's what the church is supposed to be about. You know, we cheer people on for honestly owning their sin. So I need to stop looking at someone else's speck and start looking at my plank. I mentioned the serenity prayer a few weeks ago. There's another version of the serenity prayer for this message today. And that is, God grant me the serenity to accept the people I cannot change, the courage to change the one I can, and the wisdom to know it's me. Today, this message is about giving you an opportunity to think about what God wants to change in you. What's your plank? Start listening for God to whisper to you about what it is. See, when Jesus calls us to focus on the plank in our eye, he's calling us to take responsibility for our own life. He's reflecting here a deep truth about God and how he made us from the beginning. Genesis says God created human beings. He created them godlike, and God blessed them. And he said, prosper 
reproduce, fill the earth, take charge, be responsible for the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, for every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. God made us to be responsible. It's a, a God-like thing to be responsible, to have a little sphere that's under my dominion. People are actually happiest when they have responsibilities. This is actually part of what we've been learning about in the Sermon on the Mount. You have a kingdom. Your kingdom is your life. It's God's gift to you, beginning with your body. Like you were meant to reign, empowered and led by God over your little kingdom. How will you spend your time today? You will decide. How will you treat other people today? You will decide. What will your attitude be today? You will decide. What will you fill your mind with today? You will decide. God made people to be responsible and then he gave one rule. He said, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but the first man and the first woman do. And notice what happens. God asks Adam, have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Now God asked him a real simple question. Adam could have just said, yep, you know what, my bad. You know, you gave that command to me, uh, so you know, don't blame the woman. But no, Adam throws Eve under the bus. It's not my fault, it was the woman. And not just her, it was the woman you put here. Who made this mess? God did. And then God questions Eve and Eve looks for someone to blame as quickly as Adam did. Question, were Adam and Eve the last married couple to blame one another? <laughs> Not by a long shot. Now this doesn't mean don't confront each other. It doesn't mean we don't speak hard words to each other, of course we do. The plank is about a, a spirit of blame and condemnation. A pastor named Andy Stanley says that a lot of times when a spouse uh, with a distressed marriage comes to talk to him, uh, all they can talk about is where the other spouse is at fault, like how they blame their partner. And Andy will say, you know, clearly the person who is the real problem isn't here, and so uh, we're gonna do what we can do. I'm gonna draw a circle, and this circle represents 100% of the chaos, 100% of the pain in your marriage. I want you to draw whatever part of this pie that represents your responsibility. So, so m make a mark on this pie uh, for your part of the responsibility. And they'll, they'll generally draw like a slice that represents like an 80-20 split. Do you wanna guess which slice of responsibility is theirs? The big slice or the little slice? <laughs> it's always the little slice. Most of the blame and responsibility goes to the person who's not there. And Andy will often say, well, uh, since so-and-so is not here, uh, let's focus on your slice of the pie because this is the only slice on which you can really work. But here's the interesting thing. In almost every case, people can't do it. They can't talk about their slice. They keep going back to the other person. People get so addicted, we do this, to complaining about the speck in the other person's eye that they cannot see the plank in their own. So we might call the, the entire circle the pie of responsibility. And I would say you could use this for your marriage. If you're married, you could use this for your work. Uh, you can use it with your kids. You can use it with your parents. Now, if you focus on your slice of the pie, if you focus on being responsible for what you can actually be in charge of, what God has placed under your dominion, you will grow. If you focus on your part, your life will grow, your heart will grow. You'll pray, God, change me, God, grow me, God, guide me. What will happen over time is your kingdom will increase, your dominion will increase, and God wants that. On the other hand, if you focus on the other person, if you focus on here's what they're doing wrong, if you focus on assigning blame, again, it could be in a marriage, it could be at work, you know, what someone is not doing at work, what will happen is your problems will grow, your resentment will grow, your negativity, your negativity will grow, and your little kingdom will get smaller and smaller and smaller. See, blame is not productive. 
Blame wastes energy. Blame spoils relationships. Blame uh, poisons families. It undermines workplaces. It violates love. You see, taking responsibility for your life is part of God's plan for your growth. It doesn't mean you deny uh, that you may have been of the victim of horrible abuse or betrayal or disease that you didn't ask for and is out of your control. Uh, what it actually is, is joining my little kingdom, such as it is, with all of its limitations into God's great big kingdom and his plan to change everything. There was a, a brilliant thinker uh, at Stanford who was actually converted to Christianity as an adult by reading about the theme of blame in literature and history and how toxic and destructive it is and then reading about it in the Bible and seeing how God turned things around. And here's the idea. All people, all societies, uh, all cultures have a custom of scapegoating. Scapegoating is that practice where we find someone or some group to pin all of the blame on, even for things that are not their fault. Gerard said, it's almost like a, a safety valve. It's like all the, the blame for resentment, rivalry, anger, or whatever gets put on them so that we don't have to own it ourselves. One kid in grade school might get picked on because they look differently or they act differently or they're clumsy or considered unattractive. And no one votes on this, but somehow everyone in the class knows they're the scapegoat. A whole movement uh, of family systems theory was actually developed at Stanford a couple of decades ago that said families very often have scapegoats. The one kid in the family who's the black sheep or who all the problems get blamed on so mom and dad don't have to look at themselves. And then Gerard said nations have scapegoats. You know, for Hitler, it was above all the Jewish people. Uh, for Stalin, uh, it was the dissidents. In Rwanda, it was the Tutsi. Uh, scapegoating people means dehumanizing them. Now, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the, the priest would actually have a goat chosen, and it was called the scapegoat. He would put his hands on it, he would confess uh, the sins of Israel over it, and he would release it into the wilderness simply as a picture of the sin of Israel being removed and forgiven by God. Uh, this was just a picture, but it's actually where the name sta scapegoat comes from. Gerard said that in ancient cultures outside of Israel, uh, sacrifices often involved humans, human beings, human victims who were sacrificed to placate or appease the gods. Uh, they were human scapegoats, which meant all the problems of society or the tribe were pinned on them. The idea was sacrificing them would uh, heal the community from all the chaos that no one wanted to own. In fact, the idea that scapegoating a victim would heal the community's problem was so deep that the, the Greek word for victim, the one that would be sacrificed, was pharm pharmakos. Uh, we get the word pharmacology from that. And that's why no one to this day wants to go to the pharmacy. Um, we see this dynamic at work in the Bible in the story of Cain and Abel. Uh, Cain, unlike his brother Abel, uh, fails to offer God a proper sacrifice. Uh, he's upset and he's angry, but instead of taking responsibility and owning it, making things right, he scapegoats his brother and gets rid of him. You know, if I could just get rid of Abel, I'll be okay. And Gerard noticed in the Bible something unprecedented that happens. Uh, stories of blame, scapegoating, would be told, but these stories are actually sympathetic to the victim, to the one who gets scapegoated. God cares about the victim. Uh, God condemns the act of people and families or nations of scapegoating other people. God said the blood of Abel cried out from the ground. Uh, Joseph's brothers scapegoated go to just Joseph and they got rid of him. They think, you know, if we just get rid of him, then we'll be okay. But God cares about Joseph. In other words, in the Bible, in the, the ancient universal practice of scapegoating begins to be undermined. It begins to collapse. And all of this comes to a climax in the person of Jesus. I mean, Jesus is the holy 
innocent one. He is utterly blameless. He is the sinless one. And the powers that be, the religious leaders, the political leaders, the, the money changers in the temple, they all decide Jesus is their problem. They make Jesus the scapegoat. The one man who could have saved him, Pontius Pilate, publicly washes his hands. You know, don't blame me. I'm innocent of this man's blood. That's the way we do things. But of course, no one is innocent except Jesus. On the cross, he lays bare the evil, the violence, the injustice, the, the wickedness of scapegoating. We're told in the New Testament, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges, judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. You know, in Christ's great love, he absorbs all the sin, all the hatred, all the violence, all the wickedness of the world upon himself on the cross. He pays the price. He makes atonement. In his resurrection, he says, now the way of blaming and stigmatizing and condemning and rejecting is over. Jesus has become, against all odds, the great scapegoat, the ultimate scapegoat, the final scapegoat, the one who takes our sins on himself so that we can be forgiven. And we'll talk more about this in just a moment. Journalist and author Christopher Booker researched and wrote about the basic plot lines that fill many of our stories. His book, Seven Basic Plots, pulls from Carl Jung's analytical psychology to understand and analyze stories and their meanings. And one of these categories that stories fall into is a category called overcoming the monster. And in these stories, the hero, who's often an underdog, has to destroy a monster or a villain in order to restore peace and balance to their world. And this trope is found over and over again in popular culture. We have movies like Anything That's Marvel or How to Train Your Dragon. There's TV shows like Stranger Things or Ted Lasso and countless book series that fit into this type of storytelling. But what if the overcoming the monster wasn't just for popular culture? I mean, what if we viewed this passage with a similar idea? So far, Matt has brought to light a few monsters we often have to overcome. The monster of comparison and judgment, a, a lack of ownership or responsibility, a misdirect of purpose, the monster of blame and scapegoating. You know, at times we might find ourselves stuck in moments or patterns where we focus on someone's speck rather than our own plank. You know, it can feel overwhelming to change this. You know, what, what do I do next? But, but just like the hero in the overcoming the monster trope, we can overcome some of our own. With small and intentional steps, we can practice living deeper into the kingdom of God. But let's rejoin Matt as he helps us discover what it means to be observant of and open with our planks. All right, so now I want to talk about how to practice living in the kingdom of God this week. And I invite you to say, I will focus on the plank in my eye and not the speck in everyone else's eye. Uh, that plank, a spirit of condemnation, could be based on someone's morality, uh, ethnicity, their behavior that drives you crazy, their religious beliefs, or their political ideology. It could even be generational. I mean, this stuff uh, divides churches up all the time. You know, maybe you're older, and what that means is you see someone younger and you think, you know, why don't they wear something besides ripped jeans and a t-shirt? Why do they have to pierce their bodies? Why do they have to tattoo their skin? Why do they have to listen to their music so loud? And just under the surface is, why can't they be more like me? And you end up missing the wonderful spirit of adventure in them and compassion and idealism and the desire to make a difference. Maybe you're younger. And what that means is you see someone older and you think, you know, why do they have to be so formal and so picky and so wrinkly or so Technolog technologically incompetent, you know, just on the, under the surface of that is, you know, why can't they be more like me? Maybe you're not sure whether you're younger or older. <laughs> what that means is you're older. <laughs> so this week, uh, just stop trying to straighten other people out. I have a friend who says, if you want to straighten people out, you ought to work in a funeral home because that's the only place where when you straighten someone out, they stay straightened out. Live people tend to resist straightening. 
This week, give up the practice of straightening out. This week, practice taking responsibility for your own life. And instead of automatically getting defensive or trying to justify or excuse, this week just step back and pray, God, would you help me? And actually own, yep, those are my words. Those are my actions. Those are my habits. Those are my patterns. Those are my attitudes. It's me. So this week, ask God to help you identify what the plank is that needs to be removed. You know, Jesus is right. The problem isn't just that we have a plank in our eye, it's that we don't even notice the plank. So we need outside help to become aware of what it is that needs changing. You know, the old language for this is the uh, conviction of sin that's a, a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a gift that no one wants, but it is a gift of the Holy Spirit. I'll give you a picture of this. Uh, there was a guy named Charles Steinmetz. He was an electrical engineer in the early 20th century who was just an absolute genius. And there was a story in Life magazine that Henry Ford once called Steinmetz to consult about a problem with this huge electrical generator. And it wasn't working and no one could figure out what was wrong with it. So Steinmetz went to the plant, observed it for a couple days, uh, climbed the ladder to make an X mark with a piece of chalk on the side. And he told the engineers to remove the plate that had the mark on it and replace the field coil. And they did what he said and it worked. Henry Ford was thrilled until he got a bill from Steinmetz for $10,000, which was a ridiculous amount of money back then. He asked for an itemized bill. Uh, Steinmetz then resent the bill with only two items. First, making a chalk mark on generator, $1. Second, knowing where to make the mark, $9,999. And Ford paid the bill. Now, every one of us has a plank. Maybe it's an attitude, maybe it's a habit, maybe it's a relationship. Because of that, my life is not working right. My character is out of whack and I don't even know why. This is the human condition. The psalmist says, but who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. See, that's the plank that I don't notice. And if we'll invite him, the Holy Spirit will come and make an X so that we know the problem and can invite God to change us. See, the problem is most of us would prefer to go around and make a big X on other people's lives. You know, I'll put an X on you. Here's where you need to change. You know, here's where you need to be different. Would you like to know what your problem is? You know, I could straighten you out. This week, ask God to help you know where to put the X over your heart and over your life because there's something God wants to change in you. This is maybe the greatest relationship prayer that you can pray. Lord, change me. It's not Lord, change him, change her, change them, change it. It's Lord, change me. Change my attitude. Change my pattern of negative thinking. Change my sarcasm with my spouse. Change the way that I nag at my children. Change my negative attitude at work. Change uh, my envy I can't seem to get over. Change the way I rush through every day without pausing to be grateful. Uh, change my defensive spirit. Change my stubborn streak. God, show me where the X goes. This week is all about the plank. You know, after you've worked on the plank this week, uh, come back next week because next week, we're gonna talk about the pig and the pearl. All right, let me pray for you. God, I pray that you would do that, that this week as we examine the plank in our eye, that you would, by the power of your Holy Spirit, reveal to us where that X needs to go. Help us to really consider those areas of our lives where we need to change in order to uh, conform our lives so that we're more in line with your will and your ways so that the character of Christ is being formed in us. God, would you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, uh, reveal that truth to us and help us to take it out, to actually do the work to remove that plank so that we can live in healthy relationships with other people so that we can see clearly, maybe to remove the speck from someone else's eye. 
God, would you continue to teach us, continue to shape us from this teaching of Jesus? We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.
If you heard something today that would help others as they walk with Christ, you can click on the On Demand button to share. And if you need prayer, we have a group of people that meets throughout the week to pray for your praises and your concerns and would love the opportunity to pray for you. And if you'd like to join us in our work and help us do what we believe God's called us to do as a church and partner with us financially, you can find the Give button and the Prayer button online on the homepage. I hope you have a great week. See you next time.